Welcome everyone. Welcome Andrew, Dan, Corvin, Hans, and Patrick. This is the production users call. And while I have a number of things to ask each of you, uh, I would love to hear the experiences, especially from uh, uh, first time attendee, Dan Langeel, who is you, who will hopefully describe uh, your use case, but you came across some issues that have been not getting the attention they deserve, which is the fact that some of the UEFI firmware images require Python 2 to be built and Python 2 is falling out of the FreeBSD port tree. Dan, could you introduce yourself and explain your Beehive use case? Hi, Dan Langell here. I use Beehive to get Home Assistant running. Home Assistant under FreeBSD is not the full user experience. You really need to run their Home Assistant OS in order to get all the bells and whistles, such as easy upgrades. Um, there's a lot of devices, uh, sorry, add-ons or extensions. I'm not sure the Home Assistant term at the moment, but there's a lot of add-ons that you just cannot get if you're running on native FreeBSD. So, I found a recipe somewhere for creating a Beehive instance, and it's been running fine for about two months now. Uh, I'm able to um, use the built-in upgrades and add any um, add-ons that I want, and I'm basically using it to monitor my electricity usage. Um, you know, <clears throat> do you know who did that, who, who made that? Uh set of Beehive instructions or whatever? Uh, yes, and it's not a distinct set of instructions specific to Home Assistant, I think, but it was fairly straightforward. It was just basically install this, use that, and it, it ran. It, it's, it's somewhere in my Twitter um, stream. And I've never documented it because it was very straightforward, but it is on my list of things to document. Well, I know one of the one of the guys here um, is really big into Home Assistant. He's a occasional attendee of this meeting, but not a lot. So the problem I hit was I had something installed which needed Python two. And I can't recall what that was, but I make use of a couple of scripts built into FreeBSD uh, security periodics, one of which is a package audit and one of which is a base audit. And it was telling me, hey, listen, you've got this Python 2.7 stuff installed. And it alerts me all the time. So I decided I wanted to get rid of it. And I wasn't sure what to do about it, but I had a, a theory that it, that what was using it was not actually needing it. And so I took a snapshot of um, the VM. Uh, that's a ZFS level snapshot, I mean. And then uh, deinstalled the package, stopped, stopped the VM, uh, deinstalled the package from the FreeBSD host, uh, restarted the VM, and everything was okay. I tried that again with another package and the VM just wouldn't start up. Um, it would be nice for me to have details of what that other package was, but that also is in my Twitter feed. But I didn't need the Python 2.7 package, it turned out. It was one of the UEFI packages and I didn't need it for my particular Home Assistant install. I'm guessing that's a CSM build, which was an old uh, biosimulation build that hasn't received much attention. Uh, I can tell you in just a second. I'm sure. going to look through my list of stuff. Uh, oh, yeah. It always tried to have EDK2-BHOD-CSM. And I yep. think that was part of one of my failed recipes. Yes, so this one is only required for CSM support. And um, because some time ago the EDK2 port was uh, updated, 
but um, yeah, with the new version, there's no CSM version of the EDK2 for Beehive. So, um, yeah, the CSM port was uh, left in the old version. So, um, if you build the CSM port, you still build the old version, which requires Python 2.7. Um, and for the other EDK2 ports, this issue shouldn't occur. Corbin, do you think that maybe should be removed from the Beehive uh, firmware meta package? I think when the EDK2 version was updated, there was a short discussion. And the conclusion was that, yeah, maybe some user depend on the CSM, uh, um, on the CSM support. So this package um, wasn't dropped and uh, yeah. Well, I think inclusion in the meta package and keeping it as a package in the port system can be pretty separate if we let them be. Yeah, this could be a solution. Uh, Dan L, do you recall the uh, guest OS version, such as Debian or otherwise, that Home Assistant is using? I think it's their own OS, and oh, I don't know what that is. Uh, do drop in whatever links you have. Uh, if you do mention a cool technology on the call, feel free to drop it in the chat, and yeah. I'll in integrate mm -hmm. it in the notes. So I could just link um, to your Twitter feed, which is which is an option. Wouldn't um, be the first time. I'm searching through it. Okay. Trying to find it. So to catch up, those who have just arrived, Dan Langeel, the organizer of uh, the BSD CAN conference and PGCon in Ottawa, fantastic conferences, uh, has been using Beehive for a few months to run Home Assistant on FreeBSD. And since we started this, we have uh, Andrew, Dan Langeel, Dan Bell, Corvin, a developer in Germany, Hans Rosenfeld, welcome Hans, who's uh, an Illumos developer in Germany also, and Patrick McAvoy, who's also known as BSD TV. And it's been stunningly helpful with a number of conference uh, efforts. Uh, so I generally try to front load these with developer topics. And that was actually a perfect one that's come up. It's come up on, Fed on the Fediverse. It's come up on Twitter. Um, and Corvin, I wanted to hit you with a random question, which is uh, Rod brought up on the last call the notion that, hey, because you're doing real-time work, have you looked at any of the other schedulers on FreeBSD? Because I think ULE is sometimes your friend, sometimes not your friend. No, I didn't look into the scheduler. Cool. So it's a, it's just a build option in the kernel, and it, it might uh, be your friend. And uh, finally, I tried this just this morning before the call. I put some... If you're on the document, I put uh, some error output on the in the document, which was what happens when you aim the pretty recent UEFI firmware at Mac OS. I know you made at least one change that would support um, to, to do support at least one instruction required by Mac OS. And whoops, that went to the wrong window. But thank you, Dan, for the post. That's a fault. Of Am I posting it the wrong place? It is very much the right place, but Twitter uh, meeting links can be very squirrely. <laughs> if you click them, they'll go wherever they want to go. Anyway, thank you for that. So yeah, Corvin, take a peek at that uh, output if you have a moment. And uh, who else wants to share their findings? Welcome, Daniel Bell. Welcome, Hans. And especially, do you have any news from last time? I know, uh, Patrick, you were looking at uh, following the model of the uh, FOSDEM Streamosaurus, which was a different streaming unit capturing uh, the streams from each track of this that ridiculously large conference and then making them available for speaker review as quickly as possible. 
uh, I imagine you have BSD CAN on your horizon, possibly even Asia BSD CON. Any news there? Uh, nothing yet. Really, more than anything, I've just been poking around. Uh, but yeah, anything that will help me get videos out quicker is music to my ears. Because I still have, I'm still dealing with a couple of straggler videos from Euro. Understood. And in practice, that was largely FFmpeg, just needing to run in parallel and crunch away. A lot of it, I have to. I still have to kind of pick through what they what they're doing, and then you know make it make their ideas suitable for what we're doing. Do you have any questions here and now? Or uh, one thing I think we established on the call was, hey, a dedicated Ethernet network it would be highly desirable. That's purely used for that video back channel. So very, very much so. Dan, also, is that uh, something vaguely plausible at the venue of your event? Uh, I hope so. Uh, I'm going to be pestering the people of the building and seeing if they, uh, the more, the more uh, legwork I do ahead of time is the more it seems to think. So I don't, I don't have specifics on BSD can but uh, well, I'll just pest to them and you know reference the fact that I've been doing it for X number of years and hopefully they'll, they'll let me do stuff. <laughs> yeah, so we do happen to have Dan and Gil on the call. If, if it wasn't yeah. obvious, there's two Daniels. <laughs> oh, no, 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 I'm pestering Dan about, about uh, Dan and Gil about, uh, about it. And he's kind of been like, yeah, you probably need to talk to the facilities okay. people. So yeah, I'm gonna be talking to the facilities people rather than- Wait, yeah. got it. Uh, I'm sure Dan Langiel has enough headaches. Than... <laughs> I have several. <laughs> there you go. <laughs> Understood. Um, Daniel Bell, anything new to report? Uh, nope, nothing. Uh, yeah, nothing exciting on, on my side. Uh, I'm really curious about the work you're doing with... Uh, uh, booting a booting um, a shared, I guess a shared P9 or something uh, directly to a VM so that the storage would be on on FreeBSD. I think that's what we're doing. <laughs> that's uh, what we're that would be about. it, and I'm happy to talk about that. Did I post uh, something? Maybe I did post it here or not. Let me see. Uh, yeah, okay, I can uh, I can gladly talk about that, but let's run through everyone else's interests first. This is not about me. Um, Corvin, anything new to report on the integration of your work? Uh, I'm sure the holiday slowed a few things down, but uh, everyone, Corvin has received his commitment and he's been uh, bringing in notably uh, GPU pass-through related uh, components and uh, I believe also the, the firmware that others are using. Any news, Corbin? Well, sadly, there yeah. aren't any news yet. And it's OVMF you're supporting, correct? Yes. So that's um, yeah, that's the same as EDK two, and it um. So yeah, there's an OVMF version for Beehive and for QEMU, and I'm trying to also support the QEMU version. Got it. Well, Godspeed with that. Hans, welcome. I did ping you and Vitaly. Uh, I don't know if he possibly reached out to you individually. Uh, he didn't. <laughs> okay. Understood. Do you have anything new to report or questions for the group? No, nothing at this time. Sorry. Nothing at this um, time. I'm Go just ahead. trying to keep a loop. And uh, to, to, to Andrew, who led this off. Anything else, new? really? Um, about the only thing I can mention is, you know, like I was saying earlier, I know the. Uh, what is it? The what were we talking about? Home home assistant. Home assistant. I know Mark's into into messing with that. 
So obviously he's not here right now, but I can probably yeah, do get him. Let him know. And that, that link alone, thank you, Dan. That looks very helpful because it just lays it on out. And it does segue good into what I have been working on. But let's talk briefly about the the not even technical aspects, but the social aspects of this this beehive escape no. that was described yeah. recently, yeah. where it's like, okay, the the uh, the E one thousand device emulation allows for us an escape, but then suddenly, oh well, by the way, it's uh, captured by capsicum, so not an issue. I dropped the line to John and. Uh, and Patrick, just to see if they have any thoughts. But it, if you read the comments, it's like, well, yep, Capskin did its thing. Thank you. That's great. I'm looking at how to put Beehive in a jail for also the same reason. Um, did any, just literally a poll, did anyone come across this? And what's your impression? And do you feel that either the project needs to say something or Beehive as a sort of sub project, informal project, or otherwise? I put it in the chat and I'll drop it in the notes here. And do we know if this is something that affects both platforms? Uh, that's a good question. However, Beehive has been in a zone on Illumos for a very long time, such that I believe it would be captured right there and not a problem. I'm not so. sure necessarily it would. Okay. Um, now, I know that our kernel tie-ins are very different. So Correct. But the emulation might share quite a bit. It could. So I think maybe on the on the dev meeting, this, this needs to be discussed. Yeah. So I will not drop it in the notes for what it's worth. They've know it's not really a secret because yeah, we've we've gone kind of executive session -y on some the occasional CVE, but hey, such is life. Um, well, I'll drop it in there. I've already got mentioned, and it's not hard to find. So there's that. Um, so Dan, I have uh, almost in parallel this last week been following a very similar approach with the next cloud all in one AIO image using their official VM. There's a consulting firm in Sweden that produces that VM. It's based on Debian. They do seem to be sincere about um, best practices such as no, we will not let you do stupid things. We will require SSL, we will, we will have like you know, fail to ban and other best practices. And so the, the hang up there versus standard next cloud on your platform of choice is that to use the Collabora office features, which have live editing of documents, a lot like the minutes at this very moment, uh, you need Docker. And I recall Docker being the killer app of FreeNAS 10, because with back in the day using Rancher OS, you could spin up a, a Beehive VM with perhaps Alpine Linux or another Linux under it with or obviously Rancher OS, and then have your Docker platform of choice within like minutes. So I've documented my steps to date in uh, the Google Doc I just linked. No, it's not yet a next cloud doc, but soon. I noticed that my firewall running PFSense, though it may run OpenSense or maybe both in parallel on two machines, uh, it has enough RAM to run a VM such that as I'm looking at my topologies of a DMZ, I could in fact have a VM simply running under PFSense. Beehive is there. If I need to bring in a firmware image, well, that's easy. It's just sitting in a directory. I do that all the time. So. In the course of that, there's the appliance image like you're using, Daniel, Dan. And what I really would like to see is to take, say, Deb Bootstrap, which is available on FreeBSD, to craft in a scripted manner a Debian environment with kernel and everything completely dictated from FreeBSD and then possibly using Grub Beehive, which did work to load, say, netboot images of the two OSs I tried, which was the Alpine netboot and core OS netboot, very deliberately load them from a directory on FreeBSD. And then if a disk image is needed for 
the Linux image. Well, hopefully that's crafted under FreeBSD with all the built-in tools and off it goes. And then ultimately that would be a, as uh, Daniel Bell pointed out, that could be a 9P uh, vert virtual file system mount. So there are no disk images in the entire structure. And I am rather excited about this topic in so far as FreeBSD has recently sprouted um, null FS file mounts so that you could create a jail built entirely of empty files that have files mounted in from the host. And so in your few kilobytes of jail structure, you can do remarkable things like kick off a tiny crafted under FreeBSD Debian virtual environment that's kicking off a Docker image from elsewhere. So I'm excited and uh, I, I do want you to drop in whatever notes you have along these lines. And hey, this is something that FreeBSD does really well. And in parallel, I've been experimenting with the MakeFS ZFS support, which means you an unprivileged user can generate a boot image from build objects and it's bootable. And uh, I'm, I'm very excited about that, but uh, let's hear your collective thoughts on all of that and goals you'd like to achieve and tests you'd like me to run because having this, this control with the bare minimum of the needed components and no ecosystems like Kubernetes and whatever Rancher OS became when SUSE bought them and made them into a Kubernetes environment and all that. Um, I, I think this is uh, very attractive. And anytime you reduce a system to reduce, say, the security attack surface, that's a small win. The more you do it read only, it's a win. ZFS is fantastic at read only components, data sets, you name it on the fly, no other system does that. So I, I'm, I'm an excited kiddo, uh, go ahead. I'll, I will polish up my little uh, minutes here. So would it be, I'm just wondering if it would be, uh, so that, that would require Linux compatibility on the, on the FreeBSD host. I was wondering if there would be an alternate way to do it where you know, we have some sort of thin VM image that then that then generates the um, you know the the contents on the on the nine P share, including kernel and everything else. Would it would it be possible to go the other way, uh, you know, the other way around and remove Linux support from the house? Well, from Not the problem mix. So, if anything, the, yeah, so one goal is to just craft the Linux environment to just boot the Docker image from FreeBSD and then boot a Linux kernel as appropriate. But what do you see flipping, inverting? Well, just that the, um, um, I don't know, the dev, the dev bootstrap onto the, um, onto, onto the system, getting the kernel. And then the, there's of course limited kernel support. So I'm, I guess I'm concerned about the about bumping up against uh, certain uh, certain issues. Whereas if we booted like a thin VM that fired a script that then loaded up the the, the shared nine P folder, we'd get the same result. Um, so like you 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 make a so basically a beehive that that makes the you know that makes the beehive Docker folders for you um, that's, that's Linux. So we don't have any Linux compatibility issues with, uh, with, with uh, I don't know, FreeBSD's various tools. Uh, I, I mean, I, I don't know if it's good. Well, no, I, I, I think we're on the same page. Problem. It's I would craft the environment from FreeBSD, but boot it under Linux. So I don't think we in fact need Linux to, to set things up. And although of course, using a, a, a VM image from Home Assistant or from uh, next cloud simply well it's all done for us but um yeah i know that i you, and i believe you tested it yourself that uh, we will not be seeing say docker with system d integration working very easily on freebsd anytime soon so i'm not looking to push the linux compatibility to its limits i'm simply looking at say the ext4 abilities and dare i say zfs abilities just to craft the environment for all this Excuse me, I have to drop off the meeting. I have a dog that needs attention. 
Understood. Thank you so much for joining. Right. You're welcome. See y'all later. Bye. Okay. Bye, everyone. Um, on this note, who else has a killer app image they would imagine running? These appliances are can be very attractive. Uh, there's the Linux to, to, to turnkey Linux project, which also focuses on you know mail server, this server, that you name it. Um, I just yesterday bumped into someone needing a ubiquity management environment, which I think is available as a VM. I could be wrong. Yeah. I well, the controller runs yes. native because it's Java. Okay. So you can do, I think, uh, what is it called? EI, EISP is is one, and then um, and then there's the there's the unified controller. So both of those products work natively. I mean, natively in as much as they're Java and Mono. That and, alone, uh, those two are reason alone to virtualize them. <laughs> And isolate oh, just, them, are they not? Yeah, right. Yeah, right. If, <clears throat> if we can have things set up on, in Beehive that will allow us to run these kind of images, that's a pretty big benefit for me, actually, because I know we, I, I, I think we get some, if I remember right, we get some stuff from HCL that's basically in Docker images. HCL, what's that? Uh, that's the owner of, of uh, Domino. Okay. Uh, IBM sold it to them a few years ago. And uses. Uh, and just to throw it out there, this came up also in the context of like QCOW2 support where a vendor provides an image. And if you modify that image, even just converting it to raw, you throw your warranty out the window despite it being block for block, arguably identical. So yeah. Um, okay, go ahead and name some images. Like what's come up, like either categories of images or specific ones. I, I do not know. Um, I just know it's come up during our meetings from some of our, um, from some of our people who deal with that. Um, my understanding is it was some stuff related to some of the more large scale hosting type things. I wanna okay. say a product called Same Time um, is using it. Of course, they call half of their product line some variant of that. So okay. that's probably not precise, but I just know that it's come up. Um, I mean, and also, okay. if, also if we're talking to the point of, you know, once you've got, once you're talking about uh, Docker, you're of course also talking, you of course can also bring in some of the Kubernetes stuff too, which is very, is something that's very convenient. And at the very least using it as a protocol to manage other things has been something I've wanted to look into, but requires way more time than I have. Um, what aspects of Kubernetes solve a problem you have at the risk of creating other ones? Just being able to, uh, just as a central management uh, type situation where, um, I mean, and this is more me personally than Prometic as an organization. Um, you know, I used to have a website that I, had set up and running, and it was super convenient to be able to, you know, bring up the whole uh, thing on Kubernetes and then using Kubernetes and then bring up the second instance of it that runs the new updates to it that I've built and set up and then swap it over. It, it just made a lot of that kind of dynam dynamicism pretty easy. Mm -hmm. So being able, so, you know, being able to run that outside of the Linux world would be something that personally I would be interested in. But that that was since that was all custom Docker images, being able to move that to something else that didn't necessarily depend 
on a lot of the specifics of Linux should be possible. Yes, and with some irony, just having it under Beehive makes it rather FreeBSD and Illumos compatible by pushing that. Easy oh yeah, that too. <laughs> it's just like, okay, well, <laughs> Linux stays Linux and we just contain the heck out of it. Um, I posted some links, Andrew, of the same time community server, which might be what you're referring to. I don't know if they're in, of any interest outside your organization, but hey, um, it's a, a business use case. <laughs> Um, there was a brief moment where the use of three NAS 10 Plex Docker put FreeBSD Plex packages at risk because the maintainers thought, well, you're, you no longer need a FreeBSD port or dare I say a Lumos port because you're, you've got it covered through Docker. And fortunately they didn't pull that support, but there is that risk if we adopt these third party ecosystems and rely on them heavily and then forget the fact that we have very competent OSs with great ports ecosystems, just saying. Um, well, that's kind of also why I wanted to, I mean, that's kind of part of the whole comment of, you know, be able, being able to use it as an API to control host OSs of other things like BSD or Illumos. Mm -hmm. That and I just like to continue to have my Lumos tools that I like. Sure, totally. <laughs> Out of your cold dead fingers. Um, so and other... I hate system D with a passion. I think Understood. we're all on the same page there. So just for the sake of the conversation, other over the years appliance images you've come across that just stand out as just well worth the trouble of saving the trouble insofar as, as Dan pointed out, a lot, a lot of them have integrated tools or especially in like the, the security efforts of the next cloud image. Well, they've done all that homework. I don't want to retrace their steps and hopefully they're doing the right thing. Uh, that's actually a time saver. So, and then from an updating perspective, the whole livestock versus pets approach of just repaving that image frequently is, it's actually a good thing. So, uh, Let's see. Uh, I let's see if there's a ranking on uh, what's that Linux Turnkey Linux Turnkey Linux. They might have a list of their top favorites. A hundred plus free, ready to use. So let's see. Do they rank them specials, content management? Do 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 do. do. Um, right off the top. Own cloud, Redmine, Udo, which does run on FreeBSD, by the way. Udo is a, a like constituent management system and ecosystem lifestyle. But um, do, 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 uh, note. Okay, uh, so anyone uh, other images that you really wish you had? Because I'm totally happy to spin up some tests. I don't have images in particular, but there are like quasi commercial applications. Like I use um, like Rocket Chat as a, as a cheaper Slack replacement, um, which, you know, basically should work in FreeBSD, but it, it, uh, it, it compiles a node and has some requirements that just will will give up and die if they see mm. it's it's running on FreeBSD. So having that in a in a system as described where we have direct access to to ZFS because it's just it's just Mongo and Node. It's it's nothing. And there's situations in Linux where you know people say it's open source, but it's really just I mean it's open source but not open. Let's say. And it's really only going to work on these specific distributions of Linux. So I get stuck there. But the biggest reason why I need to, like, like as, as you said, there's good reasons to use Beehive uh, to, to, to limit, uh, you know, CB, CPU and RAM consumption and so on. But getting the storage onto ZFS where it's, it's better managed would be just, just beautiful. 
So, I mean, I guess, I guess what I'm asking for is like Debian generally, <laughs> not, not necessarily an application container, but, um, but just using this technique has, uh, you know, extremely, I mean, it has a lot of benefits. That, uh, so Debian yeah. and 9P are rather attractive and note, I, I do have links in my little doc there of, hey, here, the QMU project has probably the best nine root on 9p docs out there and they do support it and note that the beehive 9p server can be it's like three files or two files it can be built on its own and spun up as a very simple 9p server not super high performance not super multi-user however it works and it can if for example you need 9p running at the moment you run say uh be, grub beehive to launch to get the image up. If you have like a chicken and egg issue there, you could in theory have the 9P server standing by. So there's that. So, okay, so Debian 9P, I totally see as being attractive. Debian has proven a rather popular platform for say Proxmox, for Trinest Scale, for a whole lot of appliances. And speaking of like, it's open, but it's not. Um, zero tier came up this week and it is open source. However, it is a massive service provided by the organization that produces it such that uh, while in theory you can spin up as a zero tier alternative with your own cute name, you're pretty much not going to be compatible and might not get very far. So uh, I can see how, yeah, let's just component by component look at what works on its own, what does not. Um, so I will focus on Debian 9P. So how far are, are there people that are running, that are serving 9P on top of ZFS to Linux Beehive VMs right now, like today? I have not encountered one. I did do some 9P tests with just the Linux user land attaching uh, for my collapsing with stack talk. But no, that is that that's eyes on the prize. I will I will I will continue at it. Um so yeah, uh, no, I haven't seen it in action yet. I just got as far as I documented in that document and I I belted all that out just so I don't forget it. <laughs> so following Dan's model of having a blog. I don't, which I don't remember off. this. I'm sure it's been discussed somewhat, but does 9P help with our old problem of um, being able to live expand a volume? Oh, uh, in theory, yeah, because it's just a data set. It, would, it wouldn't it would know that it got bigger because it's all file level. Uh, in FreeBSD land, as you've been following along, Jan has discovered some delightful CTL and Verdio SCSI opportunities, but that's like disk images that change the number of total blocks, et cetera. So yeah. no, I think your storage issues go away. And I suspect unlike under NFS, it could, oh, that's a very good question. Can you nest data sets under it such that in my view of the world, much of it is read only. Just, just if you don't need to write to it, it should be read only for security reasons. Um, that's actually totally a valid question because I came across that just yesterday. Um, because I know one of the biggest things that, that I run into on Beehive is when one of my customers tells me how much data he needs and he is horribly, horribly wrong. I see. Yeah, there's that. Um, Which is just about all of them. Nobody knows how much data they need ever. They need more. Both external and internal customers. Mm. So inevitably that means using uh, Zvols, I have to have a downtime because I at least have to restart the, the machine. I probably have to expand whatever the file system is under it. And um, so if I have a, uh, if this solves my problem with that, then that would actually be very, very nice. I confess I didn't look at it per, from that perspective, but 
Yes, I absolutely. And, and we'll, go ahead. I was going to say our our Linux stuff that we're doing is already on Debian, or we we just got through basically migrating it all to Debian, or oh, are in are in the process of. I shouldn't say got through, but that's one of the things that we're doing because. What OS was it on before? CentOS, and they're oh, right. <laughs> yeah, I've heard of it. <laughs> What's that, Grandpa? Yeah. Um... Well, they, you know, they did the whole thing of where it's not going to follow anymore. So at that point, it's like, well, that was our own. That was our reason for choosing CentOS was that it followed Red Hat Enterprise. Right. If it's not going to do that, there's no point in us in us using that. Um, flipping over to Debian at the same time as we're doing upgrades makes sense. And so that's what, we, what we've done. So especially if we've got this um, Debian 19 stuff, if people have got some work done on that to the point that it's worth at least trying, I'm interested. That, okay. that, that will save me a lot of work. Yeah, amen. Fuller uh, app. Uh, grant. And of course, with ZFS, you get the entire ecosystem of quotas and yep, you name it. And on top of that, um, Alan Jude kindly clarified on the Hambug talk this week, uh, conference, uh, the user group meeting this week, that the top on FreeBSD and possibly Illumos is using the actual low level case stat counters on data sets for performance metrics. So you can say that this ZVOL or data set is receiving this amount of traffic, which is like X-ray vision if you've broken down your, your storage into like per user data sets. Now the idea of say sharing each data set over NFS individually so that you don't have collisions on inode numbers, et cetera, might be a bit unwieldy. However, it's absolute X-ray vision. Uh, I want to explore every opportunity there. And you can just get the raw data from, from case stats by, de by data set. You can uh, sample it, sample it 10 seconds later, subtract the, the initial from the new and do the math and get some totally flexible, totally text-based real-time stats. Very, very cool. So uh, ZTOP is the tool and there are some others related to it, but this one is just directly pulling that. I'm just delighted. On FreeBSD, maybe. Okay, so yes. So Free I guess the thing I need to be bingo looking into is whether or not there's a uh, 9P server options on the Illumos side. I think they're there. I'm pretty sure on, how on to, OmniOS. How to... Uh, activate them and, and then I can see how they work. Okay, two clients Wednesday <laughs> uh, in variable, you want more storage. Got it, okay. Um, that would be the upstream and there uh, it's in exactly fresh port sysutils, good man who's posting that Patrick. And so, yeah, uh, it's worth, fortunately, uh, point being, even if the tool is not on a Lumos, the raw information is available and an afternoon of scripting could get you halfway there. And so, yeah, uh, I think it's written in what, Go or something unusual, but that's okay. Anyway, so I suppose as any good Beehive discussion would go, this gets into a ZFS discussion because, hey, they are often going hand in hand. So um, transparent appliances, if I'm uh, projecting and hearing correctly, is that uh, is very attractive insofar as everything's on a file system in ZFS and it happens to boot a foreign OS like Linux. All the image is maintained by a team dedicated to the security of that appliance and we just boot the thing up and update it as appropriate. It's just rather attractive. Um, those who are hosting clients, perhaps Daniel B, do you have clients running those guest OSs rather than a client, but it's actually with a, an, a, a client with a pet rather than a livestock <laughs> number? 
Um, I've moved everything over to more or less a, an appliance model. I do have one client that, uh, you know, that the, that the, my contact there is pretty hands-on and, and does his own thing. So I do have some jails that are a bit hairy, but, uh, yeah, most, most everything is as appliance model as it can be. Okay. So a bit like Corvin tapping, tapping into OVMF, tapping into something like turnkey Linux, uh, would be attractive such that if it's a meta package or something that just says, okay, enter the URL or name of your favorite turnkey package here, and we'll have it on Beehive in like five minutes. That could be attractive. And yeah, for sure. At least for prototyping. I mean, I don't, I don't tend to use Docker if I can help it, because if I'm going to use something seriously, then I'm going to want to tune it. And I know that I'm probably in the minority in the computer science fields for that these days, but um but yeah, for, for prototyping, for sure, you know, okay. and for, and for stuff that like doesn't need persistent data, like, like we were talking about uh, Collabra Office and Only Office and stuff like that. Those don't require, you know, those are truly disposable. They don't really, I mean, yes, there are security keys and stuff like that, but I have multiple of those in, in different, in different data centers. And if one breaks, I just use the other one. Um, so those types of things are absolutely perfect for um, for appliances, and that's you know a good percentage of the stuff that we use are tools, you know, like that. Um, well, and at least uh, at least on the Kubernetes side, if I remember correctly, they've got built-in ways to distribute those keys easily, so that you know even though they are disposable, you get those keys put in when you bring them up. Yeah, I need to. I, I need to do it, more maybe? of that in my, I mean, for sure, I need to do, do more of that. I mean, a, a lot of, you know, a lot of DevOps people, like, like if you're not doing it with Kubernetes, that you're, you're making a bizarre choice. <laughs> I don't know if I necessarily agree with that, but, but it does have its, its benefits. And, you know, I definitely need Kubernetes in my fleet. That's something I'm going to be working on early this year for sure. I would like to use it far more than I do. I will say that because like I said, it's just, it's, it's a matter of a convenient way to control massive numbers of things. And so, so would you, would you, do you find that it eats too much, too many resources if it's if at the lower, at the lower scale levels though? So I feel like there's, I feel like that's, possibly something I've observed. I mean, it depends on, on how low of a lower scale level you're talking about. I mean, if you're talking about, you know, six VMs that all are interrelated or six, six containers that are all interrelated and all have to talk to each other. No, it, that, it's useful for that because bringing that all up at once and being able to tear it down at once and doing all of this at once is useful. Where do you draw that line? How many machines? Because with my next cloud, I wanted one VM, probably even hiding in my PFSense and as narrow a tiny stack as that's possible. So probably where do you low start enough. using it? That, that's probably low enough that I wouldn't bother. Okay, where but, would you start? Like you mentioned six, 60, 600. <laughs> where, where's that number? Um, I think if there are two, if, I think there there are multiple, meaning more than one interconnected yeah. okay. interconnected piece. It's probably worth it. Okay. Yeah, that's, I, cool. I, that's that's kind of how I would view it, with the understanding that as the number of interconnected components goes up, the the reward is the reward up. goes up. Yeah. Amen. Greatly. Fine. Hey. Um, yeah, I think it probably it's, I think goes it's, up exponentially as you add more machines. Ironically, I think that it makes more sense when it's self-hosted because you're not, you know, for, for Amazon, they charge you like a, for an EKS, they, they charge you a hundred bucks on the top. So somebody needs a $5 instance and they spin up Kubernetes for it. Okay, well, 
<laughs> I, I, it doesn't seem to it doesn't seem to make uh, nearly as much sense in the in the cloud as it does actually self hosted, which I will <laughs> I I will say that everything I said is based on the idea of self hosted. Right. Yeah. Oh, good. Yep. Yep. Yeah. I mean, I, yes. I am I, I I am a one of the firm sayers of the mantra: there is no cloud, just someone else's servers. Yeah. Me too. And if you're on someone else's server, you're using Kubernetes, but you don't know it. <laughs> They're managing you somehow. And you, yeah, so anyway. Um, interesting, beautifully um, put. As we talk about our, the, the, uh, we talked about the, the P9 stuff I checked. Um, R th on uh, the Lumo side, R38 definitely has support for it. In fact, the zones interface will automatically set the whole thing up for you. Ooh, beautiful. Excellent. Um, confirm. I'll link the man page oh. in chat. Set nine pieces of board and we'll set up the. It's a man page, so you'll have to search for. Yeah, excellent. Copy. Um... So, this is something I want to play with. Yes, and it will have limits. And one bummer is that the Ganesha NFS server that happens to have a 9P server hiding in it might be a bit neglected on 9P. So that is worth visiting on from probably Linux, which has the best support. I think it was going full circle. I think it was Python dependencies that uh, took Ganesha out of FreeBSD, despite the fact that it was working just fine for a little bit. Um, fresh ports.org. Well, if this, if, this uh, if we're using the same nine, uh, 9P support on both sides, then um, yeah, Ooh. this is definitely something we should probably put some development time into it between Ooh. both Ooh. sides. Okay. And the Ganesha kmod on freebsd was updated in well what kmod but it's a user space file system but anyways it updated in september and uh it claims like 9p 2000l support so yeah um i think a little birdie told me ganesha is one of the killer apps on uh TrueNAS scale so uh let's uh let's look i'll put in here look at uh, 9p support okay so yeah that i the, the true eyes on the prize is uh, Z ZFS data set pass through so that it's not NFS, it's not 9P, it is just sort of storage shows up magically in the VM and we move on. So a vert, uh, vert IOFS in theory does that and it's been in various states of progress on different operating systems, but I, I wanna be there. Um, and scales and zones within our disposal, hopefully we isolate appropriately and a VM cannot harm so, uh, the hosting file system. Go ahead. So at this point we're, you know, obviously we have, we have Debian support for it. Uh, what OSs, are there other OSs that we do and that we do have support for it? Do we know? Uh, too early to say, uh, I, believe either Arch or Alpine, oh, it's in my doc there, I, either Arch or Alpine had maybe some uh, nine piece support. So let me put in search for okay. TDMU. Uh, so we're probably, we're, we're probably discussing the Linux side of things for guest OSs. Yes. Or actually um, running oh, plan nine. <laughs> correct. So I do have a section in the doc on all the nine P links I could find. One of them was Illumos based, I believe. And on top of that, here we go. Uh, bah, 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 let's find that Debian Stack Exchange. Uh, oh, here we go on Illumos. Uh, let me drop this for you, Andrew and Hans. Boom, topic box discussion on that. Um, Oh, what was it? Uh, oh, yes, uh, the Juniper 9P client for FreeBSD. It's, it keeps coming up and not getting the attention it needs. And Steve was active on the call, but uh, that is a roadmap to have 
FreeBSD on FreeBSD or FreeBSD on Lumos, ironically, uh, have 9P boot support. So uh, the, you can definitely find artifacts of that in the minutes for these calls. And uh, uh, Alan Jude dropped in on about a month or so ago saying, hey, there was a knock on their door for 9P improvement. So that's, that's hey, I want to help get us there because I, I don't want to see an ext 4 or XFS this image again in a stack that can be remarkably small. And on that very point, while we generally all turn off a time, a time can be your friend insofar as you boot your VM, you look very closely at a time and even ZFS diff. And lo and behold, you get to see exactly what files were touched to boot it. And then you're surprised that, wow, we have this directory full of locales that aren't touched because I specified the one locale I want and the, the Russian one and the Thai one aren't used. Well, fine, you don't need those. So a bit like using LDD to identify dependencies, a time can be your friend because if it's access, by definition, it is probably needed to do whatever it's doing. So I've been tinkering with that in FreeBSD land, but well, I know get there. I know um, in our pool creation, we disable a time, but if we ever needed it for something, wonderful thing about ZFS, we can specify it on just the part we need it. Without remounting. That's Without crazy. remounting. Yeah. Uh, and, and Heck, I gave a SNEA talk on exactly this, that like, look, you, you, can, you can go read only on the fly. And I don't think the security community has grasped that. It's like, this is magic. This is, this is great. No root remounting. It's like, please, it's great. Please jump in there. It's free of charge. Half, half the things in ZFS, I think a good chunk of the computing community don't grasp the implications of. Nicely put. A quarter of them I probably don't grasp the implications of. It's only taken me about a decade to learn those case stats on the performance for data set. But anyway, there's that. Um, Oh uh, yeah, Corvin, I don't know if you looked at that output, which I think is even from UEFI rather than Beehive itself. It's a text in them. Yes, it looks like a UFI issue. Okay. Uh, I confess as my old Mac OS gets further and further unsupported by both hardware and Apple and you name it, I sure want to virtualize Mac OS. Uh, the Hackintosh folks are somewhat helpful. They've done a lot of the, the legwork to get various things working and they use things like um, refined and refit. And I don't know if I've used those successfully under Beehive, but maybe they work just fine. I know say GhostBSD is using refined. And well, as a reminder, if you're not on Apple hardware, it's a copyright violation. Correct, but there's very good Intel hardware and one can run FreeBSD on it. And so, yes, I can use Mac OS on FreeBSD on my Xeon based Mac Pro here, pre trash can. So, no, I would never ever break a rule like that. Um, I have a Mac mini server i7 that's begging for a task like this. So, I, I will fully comply with. We, we, we've got some Mac users I had to point that out to. Oh, I see. Because I don't want to deal with not it. I've done. I've dealt with them before. Understood. So I'm not advocating any violation of those rules. I'm just advocating a real file system, a real everything in that environment. Yeah. Like, wow. They're. Uh, that would be a bit orthogonal. To discuss the removal of decent networking and file systems from Apple professional products, which I bump into in Hollywood because, hey, they have to like make movies and I, Apple doesn't get that. They think iCloud and Wi-Fi is adequate for like video editing. It's like, eh, no, it's not. I'm sorry. And no, we don't want copper 10 gig. But that I digress. And I'm sure Jan has pulling, stories to tell because he deals with that all the time. Go ahead. You're, you're pulling video from a, from a red camera. That's not small. <laughs> Correct. Yeah, and they're moving to 8K. They're like, yeah, all over the place. Um, that said, uh, I've brought this up in the past. VGPU, I think, is what AMD calls it. Maybe that's NVIDIA. But uh, in the future, 
people use high-end GPUs and RDP and do the video editing with just seeing the results rather than passing 40 gig traffic over the land. But that is proving frustrating on Proxmox. The vendors are not our friends. They often have the drivers you need behind either paywalls or in one case, some dude on GitHub who made the AMD worker uh, drivers work for their air quotes open GPU implementation that works with exactly one card and its dual variant. So uh, Corvin, feel free to make uh, vGPU work fantastically well in in uh, in Beehive because wow, even even Linux guests were a problem. Windows guests work fantastically well. They have all the magic from Citrix and at Microsoft and you name it. But a Linux guest or a FreeBSD guest under this environment don't even work correctly. Just that where the the server is brokering saying, hey, you this VM gets this portion of this GPU. But someday that will happen along with transparent file system support to virtual machines. Anyway, let's focus on the future. Other questions, requests, ideas. Uh, BeehiveCon Tokyo is on the table. BeehiveCon Ottawa is on the table. Um, it, yeah, that's been a you know one day event dedicated to this. Uh, there was definitely not one in Vienna, but hey, uh, that's such is life. We're still getting up from under a pandemic. Um, anything else or let's call it good at just five minutes after the hour. So Andrew, I will, but uh, Andrew and Daniel who stepped away, I will work on that 9P root support. That's exciting. Um, step one is simply having the, the VM attach and actually while i have you let me jump into my presentation that i believe has the syntax so i do not want those i want slides i want collapsing 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 the stack h d okay so if i do a search 9p 16 reference references, hold tight this is my gift to you because Andrew, this might be something you can spin up in Illumo sooner rather than later. Oh, vert manager. Vert manager might even have a notion on say Linux land and friends. Um, Uh, yeah, I will share in the chat. I think this is readable. Here is presentation. Let me make sure it's readable. Anyone with a link. So yeah, you can take a peek at that. On say slide 31, I address that. And let's see. Uh, fine, let me throw it in here. Uh, Anything else? Uh, then, I think that's about it. This has been a pretty productive call for me. And inspiring. Hey, because uh, that's that's critical. <laughs> we have to have motivation to do this all. So yeah, thank you, Andrew, for your insights. And feel free to rope in Mark and say, hey, you know, cool stuff's yeah. happening. Uh, Michael's. Well, I know that it's, <clears throat> I don't know when I'll get to it, but testing performance and things have been a thing for me and Mark to start doing for a while now. Just between the two of us, we can't find the time. Understood. But I especially now want to want to add 9P to that list of things that we're going to be checking. OK. Um, so here is some syntax for EFI vards, like right out of the presentation. I did the homework, so I may as well uh, not reinvent this wheel. Cool. So 
Okay, let's let's make that so. I will try to have you some nifty news on an OS or two. Uh, I'll start the year there. So it is 10.09. Anything else uh, in Pacific? Anything else? And I should have this posted hopefully within the day. Uh, the YouTube environment has come a long way since I last used it early with uh, BeehiveCon. So it's, it's actually pleasant. It's a little strange. Well, thank you. Take care, everyone. Have a fantastic weekend weekend. Have a wonderful day. Bye. See you, Hans.